it looks like we still have a few people that are connecting to audio. So I will drag out my sentences <laughs> until we're all here. And I'm sure all of you have seen the, uh, uh, the notation in the, when, you're, um, when you're connecting that this is being um, recorded. So if you don't wanna be seen, you can turn your cameras off. If you're okay with being seen, you can leave your cameras on. I ask everybody though, that if they could keep their audio off, um, just until we open up for questions as it can sometimes challenge uh, technology. So uh, without further ado, I would like to express my, my deep pleasure at uh, inviting Justice Leonard Marchand Jr. to the Green College J.B. Klein Lecture Series. Uh, those of you who haven't participated before, I'm Michelle Good. And I've been hosting these for almost an academic year now, um, much to my pleasure. It's been a real learning experience in many ways. And, uh, and um, as much work is involved in it, I, I think I'm gonna be sad when it's over. Um, so I will just uh, uh, introduce Len a little bit. Len and I have known each other for a long time. So he'll, I'm sure, forgive me if I don't refer to him as justice or judge during the course of <laughs> the course of, of our conversation today. Um, Len is a member of the Okanagan Indian Band and grew up in Kamloops. And he his first venture into post-secondary education was a Bachelor of Science and um, then completed a degree in chemical en en engineering at UBC and worked in that field for about five years and then realized he wanted to do something else and went back and graduated from law school in 1994. Um, he articled and practiced in Kamloops and between um, 19, 1994 and 2013. Um, I'm most interested in his vertical traje trajectory on the bench. He was appointed to the provincial bench in 2013 and three and a mere three and a half years later was appointed to the British Columbia Supreme Court bench. And then uh, another very short period of time, less than three years was appointed to the British Columbia Court of Appeal, which of course is the highest court in British Columbia. Um, Len has a hard time um, <laughs> realizing how fabulous he is and amazing he is. Um, and I, I, uh, I can kind of understand that, but also I think it's very important to point out that Len is the first Indigenous member of the British Columbia Court of Appeal. And his appointment uh, is historical and important in terms of uh, indigenizing the bench, if you will. So I've worked with Len as a, as a colleague and he is my good friend. And I'm very happy to have him here uh, to discuss some really important aspects of the work that he's done. Uh, over the years, in particular with the residential school uh, settlement process. So why don't we just jump right into that? Um, in 2005, Len, you, you participated and assisted in negotiating the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. Can you give us a little bit of background and talk about some of the, some of the things that that entailed? Uh, sure. Lamlumt uh, Kukschem, uh, thanks for the nice introduction, Michelle. Um, if the little reaction button had a blushing face, I would stick one up on the screen, but maybe I could just do this instead. Um, uh, well, I think to understand the negotiations, uh, I'd have to step back a, a little bit and talk about what led up to the negotiations. And what led up to the uh, negotiations were some very uh, compelling disclosures that were made by uh, survivors, including um, former uh, Grand Chief of the AFN, Phil Fontaine, uh, police investigations, a number of civil lawsuits. Uh, you and I were both involved in those uh, civil lawsuits. And um, even though I had experience taking uh, clients who suffered uh, abuse in their childhoods and in institutional settings through litigation process before I began working on uh, residential school claims, it was different working for residential school uh, survivors. And um, um, with uh, her permission, I could tell you a little bit about um, 
a, a friend of mine, a former client now, just a friend, uh, Bertha Doris, um, who Michelle knows as well, uh, who uh, was raised in a traditional um, home along the, uh, what became the Alaska Highway in, uh, in the Yukon. And uh, she was uh, client number, I guess, client number two who hired me to help her with the residential school claim. And uh, I had a group of uh, 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 clients who were advancing their uh, claims in, in the litigation process. And I picked uh, Bertha to go first uh, in uh, the discovery process, which I knew was going to be tough. And I picked her because she was smart and because she had a strong claim. And uh, she went into the discovery very well uh, prepared. I mean, I prepared her as well as I possibly could, but um, she was just shredded uh, by the experience. Um, Canada uh, in those days um, spent a lot of time asking uh, residential school uh, claimants or plaintiffs uh, questions about all the other terrible things that happened in their lives with the uh, idea of arguing these uh, causation arguments that uh, people would have been in pretty tough shape uh, regardless of what happened at residential school. So if you're an Indigenous woman from a remote community, life was going to be, like to put it bluntly, pretty crappy anyway. So what, what, what was the big difference that was made by uh, you know, abuses that were suffered at residential school? Um, now, um, it was very obvious to me that, uh, that litigation wasn't a good, a good process. Poor Bertha, when she came out of her discovery, she was very confused. She wondered, oh, why, why are these people trying to blame um, the outcome of my life on, on these other things? things that happened within my family, within my community, um, when it was supposed to be like I, she was thinking, and this is going to be about my experience at residential school and how that affected me. Um, so, uh, I mean, I recognized early on that this was a poor process to resolve residential school claims. Other people did as well, including the government of Canada. And eventually in uh, 2005, uh, in the midst of individual lawsuits and, and class action lawsuits, uh, the government announced a, um, a national uh, process uh, to achieve a pan-Canadian settlement of residential school claims. There were thousands of claims that had been filed by that time, and Canada was looking for uh, a solution. Um, and they appointed former Supreme Court of Canada Judge Frank Iacobucci as the federal representative to lead the negotiations and invited everyone who was involved in, in claims to attend. So there were uh, churches who were involved and they attended and the AFN uh, attended, Inuit organizations attended their group, in groups of lawyers, uh, particularly class action uh, lawyers, attended the negotiation sessions. And I can tell you that um, I wasn't involved in the class actions at that time, uh, but I was very concerned that the settlement would be negotiated by lawyers from, class action lawyers from big cities who really didn't know uh, survivors didn't know their stories as intimately as I did and um, might come up with a settlement that, that didn't um, hit the mark. And so I attended all the negotiation sessions. I was traveling all across the country. You know, next week it's in Calgary. And it, you know, after that, I'll be in Saskatoon and then we'll be in Toronto. And um, I just put my practice, the rest of my practice to the side and attended all those sessions. Um, and there were some big issues uh, to deal with um, and the settlement um, had to tackle these, these tough issues, like um, the uh, responsibility involvement of the church, what was the relative responsibility of, of the uh, parties that ran the schools, um, how would you recognize uh, the experiences that uh, all residential school survivors went through, that separation from the family and, and being uh, treated uh, poorly, not having good food, um, having sacred objects taken away, um, just uh, generally... Um, um, experiencing um, having family and community and way of life denigrated on a, on a at times daily basis. How do you deal with that? And how do you separate that from dealing with the people who suffered horrific uh, physical abuse, horrific sexual abuse, horrific other kinds of abuse that had terrible uh, long lasting consequences? Um, there were issues around um, how to um, help people uh, be better. Uh, what about um, how to um, help people with their, with their healing and, and treatment and, and, and their future path. Um, what about everybody else, like the survivor class, like, or they, or, sorry, the, uh, the uh, 
not the, not the survivor class, but the class of people like Michelle and me, who are children of survivors um, and grandchildren of survivors and communities. What about them? How do you how do you address uh, their issues? And uh, and through the negotiations, Michelle, if you'd like, I could describe what the outcome was. Yeah. So so yeah. So through the negotiations, there were five elements of the settlement. Um, one was something called the common experience payment that was a payment that was made to all former uh, residential school students, people who had their um, heads on the pillows at night in the residential schools to recognize those common uh, harms that they shared. Um, and the payment was based on the length of time that the person was in the, um, had been at the residential school. Um, the theory being the longer you're there, the, the more uh, harm you experienced. Uh, so there was a formula, $10,000 for the first year of attendance and $3,000 for each year after that. Um, then uh, to deal with the abuse claims, there was a process called the independent assessment process that was created that had um, a lot of advantages over uh, litigation and also over a process that Canada was operating called the alternative dispute resolution or ADR process. Uh, but the key features of the uh, compensation process were that it was um, inquisitorial rather than adversarial, like a, like a lawsuit. So um, rather than being cross-examined by lawyers for Canada or churches, um, independent adjudicators would ask questions to learn about uh, what um, experiences survivors had at, at residential schools and how that affected them. Uh, the other key feature of that process was... Um, a, a change in the uh, what we call the causation standard. Uh, so um, instead of um, in the lawsuit, you use this but for test, but for the abuse, what would have happened? Um, and that was the reason that Canada argued, um, you know, not much would have been different. People's lives would have been pretty crappy anyway. Um, but in this process, the, the, the standard was just a plausible link between compensable abuse and, and harms that people suffered. So that eliminated um, a lot of the need to explore some of those other difficult um, issues. There was a compensation grid that kind of embedded certain assumptions like that there were probably other contributing factors. And so at the end of the day, uh, there was a much speedier process, one that would, had health supports available that could uh, generate an outcome that would be very similar to what a person could expect if they went to court and won. So um, it had uh, uh, tremendous advantages uh, in, in those ways. Um, Catholics, Catholic, ca various Catholic church entities were involved in running about 70% of the residential schools in Canada. And very few of those entities were making contributions to uh, settlements in litigation. And so uh, Canada had a practice of paying 70% of whatever seemed like a fair award and then would leave survivors to chase churches around for the other, or Catholic church entities uh, uh, around for the other 30%, which was very difficult and rarely ever happened. In this settlement, um, the, the Catholic church entities uh, did uh, sign on as well as uh, Protestant entities. And, um, and so survivors, at the end could get a, a sort of a 100% award, none of these 70% uh, um, awards anymore. That was another big, uh, big advance. Um, so it wasn't a perfect process by any means, but it was a, a vastly improved process over what had been in place beforehand. Um, other um, important elements uh, it included uh, $20 million set aside for commemoration. So it's very important to have um, some symbolic gestures to acknowledge and remember um, this history that, that, that we all share. Uh, there was $125 million that was paid to the Aboriginal Healing Foundation to assist with um, those teacher paths that people were taking in that. And that um, government has actually uh, increased that, um, their funding for the Aboriginal Healing Foundation over the years. So it's not been limited to the $125 million that was negotiated. And then the, what I've come to appreciate was the piece de resistance was the uh, creation of the and funding of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, as we know, uh, money is a poor substitute for the kinds of things that people suffered, and money you know can come and go. Uh, but uh, what lasts is the work that the TRC did, uh, and the report that they created, and the roadmap that they that they that they laid out uh, for all of us to take towards reconciliation. 
So maybe that's a longer answer than what you were looking for, but those were the things that we were talking about. Um, those were some big hurdles. Uh, time was ticking. Um, the, the agreement in principle was signed in November, uh, I think it was November 20th of uh, 2005 in uh, an office in downtown Toronto. And um, I think about five days later, uh, the government fell and there was an election called and there were lots of nerves about whether the new government that, that was elected uh, would um, implement the uh, agreement, but with very few changes that was implemented uh, with uh, court approvals across the country. That's not a very long explanation. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great explanation of that process. Um, but going back a little bit, um, you know, you've talked about how litigation was so so difficult uh, on survivors because it was so adversarial. And for those of us in the room that are not lawyers, you know, adversarial is where you have one side duking it out with the other side. Whereas inquisitorial is there, there the inquisitorial system isn't one where you're 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 trying to have one side, you know, beat out the other side. It's a question where the decision maker, or it's a process where the decision maker is asking the questions directly of the survivor. And the decision maker is arriving at their own assessment without the, you know, uh, protracted arguments or you know, the protracted efforts to um, to minimize the experience of survivors and so on and so forth. And I think that's a really important, was a very important part of, of moving into the IAP and uh, you know, less so with the, with the um, ADR, but certainly with the independent assessment process um, was providing a much safer place for survivors to simply tell their story and to have some confidence that the person making the decision is making the decision based on the story they've heard, not based on the, the, the relative strength of one lawyer's arguments versus another lawyer's arguments. So I think that was, um, that's, that's really important for people to understand. Yeah. Um, so during the entire process as well, you, you served on the oversight committee for the IAP. And maybe you can describe a little bit what that involved, what it was, um, you know, how, you know, what it consisted of and basically what the work of the oversight committee was. Yeah, I, I served on a couple of um, IEP uh, committees. One was the IEP finalization committee that negotiated the final terms of the uh, independent assessment process and the compensation rules. And then um, I served on something called the oversight committee and uh, that was um, kind of like the board of directors for the IAP. Uh, there were two representatives from the government of Canada. There were two uh, church representatives. There were two survivor representatives and there were two uh, lawyers who acted for survivors who were representatives. So it was a um, uh, balanced uh, type of committee and we assisted the, uh, the chief adjudicator who was a, um, I mean, Ted, Ted Hughes uh, was initially in place to, um, who was a retired judge and a well-known uh, figure in, in uh, legal circles in Canada. He, he was the, the kind of the caretaker uh, from the ADR transitioning it into the uh, IEP. And then a former uh, law professor and dean of law from the University of Saskatchewan, Dan Ish, was appointed as the uh, inaugural um, uh, chief adjudicator. Uh, I should say we had an, a neutral uh, chair, uh, dean of law from the University of uh, Toronto, uh, Mayo Moran. Uh, so uh, we did have a committee of, of nine, not eight, nine, uh, plus the chief adjudicator was, was there. And um, I mean, there was, there was nothing. I mean, it was a brand new uh, process that was uh, created and uh, we um, assisted in uh, overseeing the, the, the creation of, of the process. So what did the process look like? Uh, what did the application forms, what were they gonna look like? Uh, so we, uh, we really uh, hammered down on those to, to simplify them and to make sure they used plain language and they were fillable and, and things like that. Um, who are the adjudicators? What are the rules for hiring adjudicators? Who are they going to be? And um, actually going through the process of, of, not, of reviewing applications for those positions and interviewing people to assemble the roster. Um, how are they going to be trained? Um, what people do we need to, to run the process? Um, all of these kinds of things. Um, I mean, there were there were um, administrative people and the chief adjudicator who were doing the day-to-day -day work of, of 
you know, in the background, but we were overseeing those things as an oversight committee. And uh, we uh, at, at times uh, released um, directives uh, that would uh, guide um, claimants, claimants counsel and, and adjudicators on how to uh, deal with certain kinds of uh, claims. Uh, so those are uh, some of the responsibilities uh, that we had. And I served on different uh, subcommittees uh, as well that dealt with uh, some technical issues, legal issues that came up from time to time and um, that we tried to address by giving guidance to um, the parties who were involved. It's really hard to convey, I think you'll agree, um, just how intense that time was where from day to day, really hour to hour, you know, those lawyers, um, both with Canada and with, you know, claimants council and so on, really didn't know how it was going to look um, as it was all being developed. And it was, it there was a real intensity to it because there were so many people that were so well-intentioned and so committed to creating something that wasn't going to be harmful. I mean, none of this can be easy for a survivor to sit down and tell, you yeah. know, the stories of the worst days of their lives. But the amount of work that went into um, making sure that counselors could be available and would be available through the Residential School Survivor Society and, uh, you know, making sure that, that the survivor was the most important person in the room. And that, when you think about litigation, okay, where it is so harsh, it is so bloodthirsty, and it's open court. You know, there is a, there is a, a, a well, spoken and unspoken rule that justice must be seen to be done. And that means that the door is open to the courtroom. So virtually anybody could walk in and listen to somebody speaking about some of the most horrendous abuses that are that are possibly imaginable. And so to, to there was so much that was involved in creating a safe place that sort of was quite unique at the time, I believe, in terms of protecting survivors in that way that they didn't have to be in open court, protecting them that they didn't have to be grilled in a, uh, you know, in an adversarial system. And I mean, you and I as counsel both went through that, you know, where we had, you know, survivors that were just broken by the process. And, and, but it is sort of hard to imagine how much had to be changed, how many minds had to be changed, how many concepts had to be changed to create something that was, more, um, I hate to use the word, but more victim oriented. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, I agree with everything that you just said. I mean, sadly, we know that, um, uh, you know, there were some people in our profession who uh, were not uh, meeting a good professional standard in their work with survivors and they treated it like they're a gravy train rather than something that was survivor oriented. And I think we have to acknowledge that. I think we have to acknowledge that it was difficult for um, some survivors, even with the very best uh, representation and even with all the support, it was very, very difficult for people to go through the process, but so much better than the alternative. And could I uh, just give you another um, real life example? Um, yes, please. Yeah, so I, I acted for a, uh, a Dene man in the uh, Northwest Territories and uh, he'd been sexually abused by a priest. And of course, uh, you know, where he, where he came from, that was very, very shameful, even though the shame was all the perpetrators. Like, there's no shame on him, the shame on the perpetrator. But that's how he felt. And uh, he was, uh, when I first met him, he was very uh, disheveled. Um, you know, he, he wasn't clean. He was, he was, the clothing wasn't clean. He wasn't clean. Um, he was, if he wasn't living on the streets, he was a step away from that. And uh, very um, emotionally, he was struggling greatly emotionally. And uh, we went through the process together. And um, at the end of his testimony, he was so sure that nobody would believe him. Why would anybody believe him? And at the end, both the adjudicator and uh, Canada's representative said to him, um, you know, we believe you, um, that should not have happened. And we're sorry that that happened to you. Um, and just getting that, that, you know, that recognition and that acknowledgement 
more so than the ultimate award of compensation, but but telling his story and having it be believed in, in that environment was so important for him. You know, it was about a month later, I was back in Yellowknife on a different case. And I was walking down the street and, and I saw this, this client, he was across the street walking in the other direction. He didn't see me, I just saw him. And, you know, um, he had on clean jeans, a new leather jacket, you know, his face was full and he was walking somewhere. He was walking with purpose. And I knew that, um, that the process had done what it was intended to do and that he was getting back to being the type of person that he was meant to be, that he was born to be, that that really was helping him. I have many other stories of other survivors that I could tell you where um, the, this change in process made all the difference. And it was such a credible process that uh, there were estimates in the in the negotiations where the government of Canada thought, oh, maybe there'll be 12,000 out of 80,000 people who will file, file claims. I'm not sure where the, there was some statistical basis, maybe based on international experiences where, that, that they they thought that might be the case. Um, the, the AFN thought, oh, maybe there'd be 20 or 25,000 people. And there were over 30,000 out of the 80,000 people who submitted uh, claims. And I mean, if you want to put a dollar value on it, over $3 billion were awarded to these uh, claimants. Um, and it just shows you that, that, the, that the process had cred credibility, that, that, that claimants, that, that survivors across the country trusted that they would be treated right because people were being treated right. And, um, and they came forward. And I think that's, um, that's a great testament to the, again, not a perfect process. It didn't work for everybody. But it's a testament to um, you know the the, the, the diligence that uh, was uh, put into developing the process, and and the care that was taken in um, in implementing and, and overseeing the process. Absolutely, and I I think that's um, one of the most one of the if not the most important uh, point about the system is what it gave survivors beyond the monetary aspect of settlement. And, you know, in my practice, of course, I saw that as well, where people were just astonished, just astonished that they were being believed because, you know, their experience. And I mean, we see some of that now in the world with that, you know, horrible, ubiquitous question, why can't they just get over it? We still see a disbelief and, a you know, a very, very challenging disbelief. But for, for those individual people to be able to feel safe enough to tell these hideous stories, uh, to feel supported, uh, and to feel believed. Um, there's little, there's little more, I think, than that. Uh, that a, a litigant, if you want to go back to the, you know, the ultimate definition is that they are still a litigant. They are still a person that is that is trying to achieve a settlement of some sort for a wrong that was done to them. Mm -hmm. I think that is the best possible outcome um, is to have a system like that that is so respectful of the person that is coming forward. And, uh, and no, of course it didn't work for everybody because that would just be a statistical impossibility, yes. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, I believe that it worked for many, many, many people because I saw it in my own clientele. Yes. And I saw, like, as you say, the impacts on their lives. And of course, you know, there were, there were some negative in, impacts that, you know, some people who, you know, struggled and, and uh, you know, didn't have that experience where they, you know, regained themselves and, and, you know, went on and lived good lives. There are those struggles as well, but that's just part of the whole thing. And I, I do believe that this was the best possible approach, given all of the moving parts, when you think about it. It's uh, a very, it was a very, very complex thing to try to undertake, how can we create one thing that is going to be all of those things that is going to be supportive, but is also going to be um, legitimately fact-finding, um, that is going to uh, legitimately compensate people for things that they experienced. Uh, for anybody that has you know, experienced, observed, uh, or participated in, in litigation, they'll understand how how really quite phenomenal it was to be able to create a national system like this. And, um, you know, from our own experiences, it's, it's so hard to convey just how, uh, 
how intense the whole thing was moment to moment to moment. It was, uh, it was a very, very intense experience. Which then leads me to my next uh, uh, thing that I wanted you to talk about a little bit. And this was the, um, the part of the settlement that involved creating the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, you know, some of the stumbles, but also like the ultimate challenge of creating this and what the role of the commission was to be. And uh, if you can just talk about that a little bit and, uh, and we can go from there. Uh, in the negotiations, I can tell you that when I, uh, when I showed up, I was uh, focused on um, you know, my, my clients and the claims that they were advancing and, and that sort of thing. And uh, all, uh, all credit goes to the um, Indigenous organizations, the AFN and uh, the Inuit organizations who were there and participating who put the, the TRC at the top of the list. Uh, I mean, this is something that we need as a nation and this is the top priority. Um, uh, so um, nobody's looking for glory here, but if there is glory to share, it's theirs. You know, they, they really uh, were the, uh, the instigators and they were relentless in, in making sure that uh, that came uh, to pass. Um, so um, I wasn't, uh, Involved, there were committees that were involved in developing the terms of reference for the TRC. I, I wasn't necessarily involved in that, or you know, figuring out how much money they would need to to have the have a process. I, I wasn't uh, in, involved in that. Um, I mean, I don't know how you estimate the cost of a of an inquiry of that nature, uh, but but they did uh, estimate, and and uh, they, and the TRC did uh, deliver. Uh, there was the issue of assembling a commission, and you might recall that the initial uh, commission didn't get off to a very good start, and uh, and, and a second uh, group of commissioners had to be appointed. And I was involved in the uh, selection committee uh, for that uh, process, and I can tell you that it was um, a quite, um, well, first of all, it was a big honor. I, I mean, the I'm going to name drop here a little bit, but you know, uh, Frank Yacobucci, the former Supreme Court candidate judge was on that committee. Phil Fontaine, who was then the Grand Chief of the FN, was on that committee. And Mary Simon, who's now our Governor General and who was then an Inuit leader, was on the committee. And then there were these other leading uh, people from the government and churches. And, and then there was me. And, you know, I was, I was looking around the room and, and I was thinking to myself, boy, I know why you're here and why you're here and why you're here. What about me? Why do I get to be here? This is in, in, unbelievable. I'm just this, you know, uh, youngish lawyer from from Kamloops, um, and so it was a big honor to be invited to participate in that in that committee and to talk about issues, um, social justice issues, restorative justice issues, human rights issues, the importance of truth telling, um, the meaning of reconciliation. To talk about these things, uh, not just with the other committee members, who many of whom were big thinkers, um, I'll exclude myself from that list. But also with these, <laughs> but also with these um, amazing uh, Canadians who put themselves forward for consideration, and you know we we plowed through uh, lots of um, letters of, of interest and CVs, and um, and even for people who maybe we didn't interview, they had big ideas and great ideas and wonderful ideas about um, what this uh, commission uh, could look like, and. Um, you know, we, we, we whittled it down to a, a certain number of people who we could recommend to the government. We did make a recommendation to government and, and credit to them, they, they made um, the appointments. Um, and, and then the, the commission, which was led by um, then Justice uh, Marie Sinclair, had to, you know, um, get up and running. But one of the reasons why uh, Justice Sinclair was such an important uh, person to have leading the commission was because he had prior experience leading um, a commission of inquiry, the Manitoba Justice Inquiry uh, some years uh, previously. So um, he uh, and his uh, fellow uh, commissioners um, retained excellent staff and, and developed a plan to, to roll out and to meet with survivors in their communities in, uh, in local events and regional events and in national events, uh, which um, uh, some of which I attended when I, when I could. They were very moving. I can tell you, I was in the Newbic uh, and I was uh, in the gymnasium at uh, Sir Alexander McKenzie School, Sands, uh, which was the school where um, uh, residential school students attended uh, in, in Anubic, which was the uh, sort of the, the capital of the Western Arctic. 
and it was, so it was quite something for me to be in that in that building that I'd heard so much about over the years. And uh, there were um, uh, many speakers, many survivors. There were um, honorary speakers, uh, and and I and there were a lot of these health support workers that you've mentioned who were in the audience wearing their, their green vests with water and Kleenex. And I was up in the uh, up in the uh, in this uh, balcony. Uh, taking in all the proceedings and uh, one of these green workers uh, came by and uh, handed me a box of Kleenex and so of course I took it and looked around to see um, who I was supposed to pass it to and then I realized it was me because I was the person who was crying in the listening to the stories of these survivors so that I mean even a person like me who had heard these stories before was so moved um, by uh, what people were sharing in this public environment it was quite an incredible experience and I'm, I'm getting, you know, kind of, I get kind of goosebumps when I talk about it. And, and all of that information, all the documentary research that was done, all of, all of those oral histories uh, were all, you know, assembled, reviewed and assembled into this incredible work uh, that the TRC published that, uh, that sets up this, this, this roadmap. It was really a remarkable achievement. I, I, I can't, you can't even put into words. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the um, you know the integrity of the work that they did and, and the care that they took and uh, the rigor that they applied uh, to the uh, to the task at hand um, it's really uh, it's just a monumental achievement the, the report reports that they that they uh, published yeah it truly is and I think that we're we're seeing that I mean it it was a as you say, a monumental report. So I, I wonder how many people have actually read it cover to cover, but I think many, many, many people have read excerpts of it um, and have certainly read the calls to action. And the calls to action, I think, you know, continue to be a standard, you know, a, like in as a flag type standard that, that people rally around and use to uh, assist in defining their goals with respect to reconciliation. Um, and so, I mean, it is, a, I know I do, right? I'll, I'll hear things going on and I'll go flipping through the call stash and think, now is this about this or is this about that? And, uh, you know, looking at uh, how many of those calls to action have been implemented and what is the nature of the ones that have been implemented? What are the nature of the ones that haven't been implemented? And, uh, um, and I, I have some little something to say about that and we'll, we'll get back to it. But I wanted to, to you know, share your feeling of those little goosebumps that we get when we, when we remember these incredible survivor events, because, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> because, you know, it goes to the incredible beauty of those people, um, of those survivors and how they could stand in those rooms and, you know, speak that truth and how many of them both in those rooms, those public rooms, and in, in the private setting where they were having their own hearing, how many of them spoke their forgiveness, you know, spoke yes. their forgiveness, not only of the people who abused them, but of the institutions as well. And, uh, and what great, uh, just such a depth of character that they could speak that forgiveness in, um, and, and mainly that, inherent understanding that that without speaking the forgiveness that they're um you know carrying bitterness would only impede their own healing processes but you know it it's so hard to describe um just what an amazing life-changing experience it was for lawyers as well as for uh participants i i like survivors i know lawyers who can no longer practice personal injury um, because they were so deeply um, troubled by the ongoing and, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of stories of, uh, uh, of these abuses. But, you know, also, you know, the, uh, the inspiration that those stories have given many people, myself included, <laughs> you know, it was, it was those survivors that... Um, and just how incredible they were that inspired me to write the book I did that's out there doing pretty okay. Yeah. Um, so, but, but the, the other question that I, that I wanted to ask you is basically on my 
my review of the truth and reconciliation uh, calls to action, the ones that I've been able to see as having been fully implemented are the ones that are uh, that don't require systemic change. They're the ones that, you know, for example, uh, adding, you know, more more indigenous specific funding to the Canada Council for to support the arts. Um, you know, the missing and murdered women's uh, inquiry, which was, you know, phenomenally huge and important, but in itself is ultimately a one off when you think of it. And, you know, in terms of some of the uh, calls to action, um, like, for example, you know, and, and taking it into consideration right now, the calls to action regarding missing children and burial sites and how I, I would just like to hear your take on why those things, even though the, 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 the deaths of phenomenal numbers of children was known back in you know, 1907 with Dr. Bryce's report. Why do you think it, it is so difficult for the government when given this kind of roadmap, this is how you can deal with it. Why do you think that it takes, it takes finding the bones, finding those, those little kids and it was indigenous people, the First Nations themselves that initiated that. Why is it so difficult do you think? Well, you know, I'm not in a position to really talk about um, how other people uh, think or how they uh, react or um, how they how government balances all the different interests that they're that they're uh, trying uh, to balance. Um, I agree with you that um, it's uh, like I think one point is it's really hard to make systemic change. Um, I know that a lot of the people who are on this call are, are young people and, and thinkers, uh, uh, grad students, um, and um, a lot of the calls to action revolve around education, and that's going to be key to uh, making sure that um, all uh, people in Canada, whether um, uh, Indigenous, you know, old stock, uh, or most recent arrival, that everybody, um, you know, appreciates the, the history that we that we have, um, and um, you know, I think we all uh, can see uh, the benefits we derive from living in this land, and we also have some burdens that we have to bear uh, collectively. Um, so there are some important steps that that haven't been taken that that need to be taken. I think that uh, from time to time there are going to be. Um, discoveries or there's going to be something, um, you know, the, the lid is going to be lifted off of something that's going to be so startling that no reasonable person could ignore. And, and, and perhaps that's the importance of these, uh, these discoveries that have been made recently at the Campus Indian Residential School and at other residential schools across the country. Um, I think that that is so powerful um, that, um, you can have uh, a, uh, a consensus around the need uh, to, to deal with that, to address that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's sad that sometimes it has to come to something like that. I mean, um, that's not an uncommon uh, part of our shared history of Indigenous people in Canada raising issues and raising issues and raising issues that get um, ignored. Um, so uh, sadly, in this instance, um, there's been this, there's been these terrible discoveries that have uh, resulted in in meaningful action being taken. It, it, it's sad that it has to come to that. Um, I, I can't speak for the people who make those make those choices, uh, but uh, you you hope that. Um, if you can draw anything from this terrible tragedy, it will be that we develop uh, the momentum to, to carry out uh, the other uh, calls to action that haven't been implemented so far. I agree with you that, you know, sometimes it does have to be something as just as shocking as that, even though the whole residential school system was, you know, a pretty shocking thing in and of itself. And, yes. um, you know, it's just, uh, it's just so challenging when there has been, and I think you you hit the nail on the head that systemic change is hard. And I think that's what we're seeing 
in the way that the uh, the calls to action are being implemented or not being implemented is that the challenge, um, you know, one offs are relatively easy. You basically have to find budget and and you you know you you move forward with them. But the 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 more systemic changes are really really difficult. And you know, this is my this is my thesis that I that I put forward is that is that non-Indigenous Canadians need to first accept that their circumstances may be substantively changed if we uh, are to achieve meaningful reconciliation. And I think that's one of the giant hurdles um, faced by reconciliation is that in, in the Canadian consciousness, if you will, um, reconciliation involves, wow, we're really sorry, right? We're sorry. And that can be absolutely genuine. Um, and, you know, we, we would like your life to be better, but we're not prepared to, to um, I guess, change the power dynamic, which is to change the systems. And I, I you know, that's, that's kind of the way I see it. I'd be interested in the way you see it. Well, um, what I would say is that there's um, lots of room uh, for us to all get on the same page where we don't see this as an us and them kind of a thing. Like what I always say is like, we're not going anywhere and they're not going anywhere. So let's, you know, figure this out so that we can all do things that are in our collective interest and to see things like to see diversity truly as something that's beneficial to everyone. Uh, it's not just beneficial for an indigenous person or a black person or, you know, some other uh, person who has, some immutable different characteristic. I mean, um, uh, bringing uh, diverse ideas and views together is it helps uh, to create, you know, better, fairer, longer lasting solutions. And we, we need that. Um, so um, if that, that's going back to this education point that, that um, you know, people will come to understand that uh, reconciliation is something that's um, good for everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, I do have some optimism. I know lots of Indigenous people in Canada have less optimism than I have. But I mean, maybe I'm just optimistic by nature. But also, I just I look to the future and I think about all the young people who are who are learning and thinking and understanding and uh, who can uh, take action on an individual level. Um, that um, grows and, and, and evolves and, and changes and becomes the norm. Um, you know, you think about some of the things that uh, people of our generation thought or said or just were normal. Well, now we recognize and look back and go, like, well, that's not normal. And, and people think, think differently now and, and yes. behave differently and treat people uh, differently. And so I, I do think that there's, like within these big um, ideas and these big steps that are identified in the uh, calls to action, there's a lot of room for each of us to do, you know, little everyday things too, because it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a step by step, brick by brick, person by person, family by family, community by community effort, you know, to, to, to build this up to the point where um, maybe um, in the future there could be a talk like this, maybe by, uh, you know, the next generation or the generation after that, where they talk about these kinds of things, just purely from a historical perspective, right? Where it's not um, you know, just grappling with this uh, everyday systemic, um, is everyday systemic problems. So, um, yeah, systemic change is diff difficult because, um, I mean, often people don't see it. They can't even see it. They don't understand it. Like, I'm not, I'm not racist. I don't have a racist bone in my body. That, that's true. Like, people aren't kind of overtly um, racist generally. I mean, people generally want good things for people, but sometimes they don't see how the, you know, the, the system within which they operate is having um, unequal impacts on, on people. So it's, it's, it's hard because of the scope. It's hard because of the, um, I, I don't want to use the word indoctrination. There's probably a better word that your grad students can, can come up with, but I mean, we're sort of the product of our environments and, and, and we can't see things that other people can, can see. We don't feel things that other people are experiencing because we're not walking in their shoes. 
Um, so, um, and sometimes, yeah, it costs money. So there's, there's some barriers there for sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm an optimist too. <laughs> and my, my optimism is what leads me to carry on with, um, just doing the best I can, which is what I, I, I say to people about what I'm doing is I'm just doing the best I can, <laughs> you know, um, trying to do my best to, to, you know, effect some kind of meaningful something that somebody can look at and go, hmm, well, I never thought of it that way. And I, but I think you're absolutely right. And I, I wrote an essay once called the tradition, a tradition of violence. And it, it posits a theory that indigenous people are not the only people with an oral tradition. And when we, we go back to the times, and I think of course, in prairie terms being Cree, um, we go back to the time of clearing the plains around the time of the, you know, Frog Lake incident and the uh, the Métis troubles and so on and so forth. And if you go into the research, it's really quite appalling the manner in which fathers of confederation were speaking about indigenous people and their practices and their way of life and so on and so forth. Um, what I think about is what the children of those fathers of confederation heard and what they, as a matter of course, passed on to their children and their children and their children. And those, um, you know, those colonial and racist attitudes are something that got woven into the fabric of Canadian society right from the very beginning of there being a Canada. And so, so there's this massive challenge to undo certain things that that actually are the foundation of a country. Those are, I think, incredibly challenging. I won't say almost impossible because I am an optimist, but very, very, very challenging things to approach. And I, you know, I agree that, you know, we're all here, nobody's going anywhere, and we're certainly not going back to when before all of these things happened. But I think one of the critical things is finding ways, um, I guess, non-confrontational, non-accusatory uh, ways of inviting people to understand what history has been for Indigenous people in Canada and how, um, you know, if we are to see a shift in the power balance, if we are going to see more equality of opportunity and equality of, you know, the, you know, if we're going to actually see Indigenous communities become self-sufficient and self-determining again, that, that fundamental understanding is necessary. And then we can move forward. And so that's what I try to focus my work on is creating yeah. that understanding as best I can, both in my, you know, sort of just conversations with folks on a regular basis and also in the in the writing work that I do as well. But I think well, it's- writing is, Your writing is incredibly important, Michelle, and uh, uh, kudos to you for the beautiful book that you've uh, published that's uh, changing minds and hearts um, all across the country and probably around the world, really. Like, uh, honestly, it's an amazing, amazing uh, work. And um, we need more, um, accessible stories like that, that people can relate to and understand and um, that builds builds understanding and builds empathy. Uh, again, foundational elements to the work of reconciliation, which is a massive project. And um, which uh, um, I, I just, I'm doing this uh, um, for attribution purposes, not, not to name drop again, but um, my friend, uh, Russ Brown, who's a Supreme Court candidate judge, put it to me uh, in a conversation we had recently this way. He said, um, there's so much to do because there's so much to undo. And it's just, it just like, that's a simple way to capture what we're talking about. Um, and um, you know, we have to hang in there. Uh, there's people who are, who are tired and they, they're, they, they give up. And, um, but, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of other people I hope that it'll, you know, be me, um, that we're just going to hang in there and we're going to, you know, keep, keep going uh, to uh, contribute to um, making our society a, a fairer one. Well, that's, that's just a brilliant saying. I'm going to swipe it just completely without any qualms. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so much to do because there's so much to undo. That says so much in just a very, you know, that's a writer's dream, that that saying. Yeah. It's, and it's just the phenomenal and bottom line truth. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to say it was my idea, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. That's okay. And I'll share it. I, and I told Russ, I told him, look, I, uh, I'm, I'm sharing that. I'm repeating that. And uh, yeah. it's really good. It really captures the idea. Yeah. I'll be sharing it too, because I think that really it does. It captures it. And, and, and it inspires, I think, uh, that way of looking at it inspires personal responsibility as well as, you know, um, instead of just thinking this is, this is the government's job um, or this is the university's job, right? It's everybody's job in, you know, basically our, our everyday walks of life to yeah. see things differently, to challenge ourselves to see things differently and to challenge ourselves to do something about it in whatever wheelhouse we find ourselves in, whether it's being, you know, an author, yeah. An esteemed justice, <laughs> um, you know, or a student or a teacher. There, there is something for everybody to do. I am convinced. Yeah, people often ask, oh, "What, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do?" And it's really hard to give a, 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 a kind of a, a list of things that people can do. But the starting point for me is just read the introduction to the summary report of the TRC. It's about yeah. 20 pages, 22 pages. There's pictures and you know, <laughs> it doesn't take very long. Maybe you could read it in 15 minutes and then read the, read the calls uh, to action. And then, you know, you can go from there and, and kind of uh, direct your um, self-enlightenment and, 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 and identify steps that you might be able to contribute to. So every, there's a starting place. That, that, that's a good starting place. Well, I, I completely agree. And I, I, you know, one of the things that I say in these endless presentations that I'm doing, right, is that um, the burden of responsibility, the burden of responsibility for the education of non-Indigenous people has to be taken off the shoulders of Indigenous people, and that people have to accept responsibility for their own education. And here is a whole bunch of resources that you can start with, because there's so much out there now. It's not like it used to be. Yeah. So, um, so with that, we're coming up to our last 15 minutes. And so I'd like to open it for questions. If there are any questions uh, in the group, you're free to either use everybody, you're free to use the hand raise um, function, or you can write your question in the chat. Uh, it is of course entirely up to you. I was I learned a really interesting um, technique. I, uh, I was teaching, I taught a little course on the, uh, uh, through the Banff School of Fine Arts and the, the leaders there, one of the, the leading people there said, I always give seven seconds after I invite people to ask questions <laughs> because it takes, it takes at least that long for someone to formulate a question. All right, folks, here's your chance. It's not often that people get an everyday opportunity to speak to somebody like Len, that's for sure. Well, I'm just an everyday person, so it should be easy. You are just an everyday person, which is something that further sets you aside or sets you apart, is that you're, you know, just a, a decent human being doing the best you can. And that's something that I think we uh, lack um, in the world generally and certainly in the legal profession. <laughs> okay, so Naomi Lloyd, you have a question. You can put it in the chat or you can you can open up your your sound and ask yourself. Thanks very much. Um, I am from the Residential School History and Dialogue Center at UBC. Uh, and we this talk has been very timely for us because we're putting together resources related to the settlement agreement, the 2015 court case and the Catholic Church's dereliction of its duties um, with regard to the settlement agreement. Um, and my question is how did I, I know that at the last minute the Catholics had to the Catholic entities had to be corralled into a room and sort of 
um, sweet talked into participating in the settlement agreement and they were given these three terms where they had to provide the cash payment of 29 million, the 25 million that they had to make their best efforts to raise funds and the fundraising and then the in-kind services. Um, how, did, how did that come about in relation to the 30% that the Anglican and Presbyterian churches were paying? Were the Catholics being let off the hook there? Or, yeah, sorry about the long-winded question. Uh, yeah, hi, Naomi, and, and thanks for the question. And thank you for the important work that you're doing at the uh, center as well. Um, I don't, mm, I wasn't, uh, and even if I was privy, I don't know if I would be at liberty to kind of discuss uh, how everything uh, shook out uh, in those negotiations. But um, I think it's fair to say that uh, the um, um, the main uh, negotiators were the government of Canada and uh, and the church, and they were trying to sort out you know what what was what was fair. And I'm sure that it was on the government's mind not to um you know sort of crush the financially crush uh the um uh these uh these um entities that are um important um part of the fabric of our uh, community um and uh, what could what could the government of canada uh, live with because whatever didn't come from the church entities they were going to be responsible for financially um, for sure, everyone recognized that uh, we needed the Catholic Church entities to be part of the settlement, otherwise there would be no settlement. And I can tell you that there was uh, great joy um, when the announcement was made that uh, an agreement had been reached. And, uh, you know, it's open for, uh, like the terms are public, they're out there. Um, and, and people are free to, to have views about um, whether that was fair or not fair, and they're free to have views about um, um, what's happened since and, and whether uh, the Catholics, uh, the Catholic Church entities uh, lived up to their um, obligations or, or, or didn't. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. Um, so I, I don't think I should, I don't think it's really my place to, to comment too much on, on that, Naomi. I'm not trying to duck the question, but I just think it's not, uh, especially my, my role, it's not really for me to, to get into that too much. I can tell you that it was uh, critical for the Catholics to participate. It was uh, a happy moment uh, when an agreement uh, was, was reached. And, uh, you know, the terms are, are, are known by everybody. The, what happened subsequently is, is is uh, is known and um, good luck in, with your work and in, in trying to uh, you know kind of put all those pieces together for the uh, for the center because it is an important part of the history. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks. I mean, we all have to understand that you know, given that uh, that Lynn is on the bench, that there are, are and also you know the um, the nature of the discussions to begin with that there are there are some limits to to what he can and cannot discuss. Um, but as he points out, all of this stuff is public. It's just a matter of uh, parsing it out and, and um, coming to our own conclusions once we read all of the information, once we inform ourselves. Thank yeah. you for that, Naomi. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, how, we got, how, we, how we got to public isn't necessarily public, but you know, the product is, is, is definitely public. Yes, exactly. So we have another question from Marjorie Fee, and that is, do you think the recent, pass the recent passage of Bill C-15 will add to the fulfillment of the TRC calls? Okay, so there's so many different bills. Uh, Bill C-15, I <laughs> uh, don't always remember which one is... Uh, is uh, which? Yeah, okay, so uh, this is the uh, UNDRIP bill. Uh, yeah, um, so the status of this bill is, is what? I mean, I guess it died on the order paper and so it hasn't been implemented. And um, to know um, uh, UNDRIP, uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is a critical document. Uh, the TRC identifies it as uh, part of the as providing a framework for reconciliation in, in Canada. And uh, there's different, um, I'm not an international law 
uh, expert. There are people who are expert in this in this field, and maybe Michelle could invite one of them. I have a, a number of people I could recommend who could talk about the um, um, uh, what it, what under it means in Canada and what it would mean if we passed uh, a version of Bill uh, C fifteen. But uh, regardless of the legal uh, technicalities, um, it is um, an important uh, piece of legislation. I think um, it's. Uh, uh, you know, the its exact legal effect would um, come to be known uh, through the course of litigation, uh, but certainly it would be putting some ideas, um, some important ideas front and, and center, and um, will take us down the road towards reconciliation. I mean, I, I know I, I read some um, some commentary on um, how the language could be improved and be more binding and, and this sort of thing. Uh, but um, any kind of declaration like this would be probably un unthinkable 15 years ago. So yes. the fact that it's even been tabled is a, is a massive uh, step forward. And, uh, and I think that uh, if, the, if the bill is passed or a version of the bill is passed, uh, I mean, legislation is usually thought to be a remedial, like to fix a problem. And so what problem is this fixing? And, and it will have force and it will be important. And uh, the extent of, of the impact uh, remains to be seen. I mean, it remains to be seen whether it will be adopted or whether some version of it will be adopted. But um, uh, it, it, I, I can only uh, say that I think uh, it's uh, an important piece of, uh, piece of work and, um, and, and uh, let's wait and see what happens. Well, and hopefully, should this uh, should the, should it ultimately come into effect in in one form or another, it will sort of broaden the toolkit that is available to um, the government to the to the people in terms of creating um, an improved reality for Indigenous people. Um, I, I know, like I know, in my own uh, judgment writing, I've uh, referred uh, to the. The TRC report. I referred to the Murdered and Miss Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry report uh, because they're a part of our fabric now, and uh, they're things that uh, maybe not everybody has looked at. Um, and maybe I could share some of the content, and maybe that will influence uh, some ways of uh, approaching some difficult uh, legal problems that, that we have. And uh, this legislation, as Michelle says, would be another kind of uh, tool in, 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 the, in, the, in the toolkit. Okay, um, I'm just gonna ask this question here. Um, the idea of having a Commission for Truth and Reconciliation obviously had a history before its Canadian career. But what resources, if any, were lawyers working with residential school survivors in Canada able to draw from other jurisdictions? And to what extent are the lessons of the Canadian process being picked up, say, in the U.S.? If you know. <laughs> uh, gosh, um, I mean, the, um, I suppose the, the key um, example that uh, was the inspiration for the process was the uh, example in South Africa. Um, where they had a uh, horrible um, history and many deep wounds and they needed to find a way to, to talk about it and to uh, move forward. Now, the terms of reference for RTRC didn't uh, match uh, the terms of reference uh, for the South African uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but certainly that was part of the um, inspiration, if I could put it that way. Um, in terms of what's, what's happening in other jurisdictions in the US, I'm, like, I'm not personally aware of um, an uptake in the U.S. Uh, for a similar idea. I don't know, Michelle, if you are. Um, but, uh, you know, we share the, the colonial experience in Canada is, is unique, but there are shared elements in lots of countries. Like if you have a hot holiday in, in Hawaii, sure, it's part of, the, of America, but, you know, it has a different, different history. If you're in New Zealand or Australia or India uh, or um, Tanzania, uh, you know, there's there's countries all around the world that have had this colonial um, um, experience, and uh, we can learn lessons uh, from those other experiences and how they are how they've managed. And I think that uh, other um, countries can can take inspiration from us too. Okay, 
Um, I'm going to go back to a question uh, that came up just a little earlier. How would you recommend Catholic churches and schools engage in truth and reconciliation? Many Catholics today general, genuinely want to listen, learn, and engage with Canada's truth and reconciliation journey and reach out to Indigenous communities. Many parishioners want to engage, but how can they do so respectfully and impactfully? Question of the hour. <laughs> It's so difficult because, and I mean, if I can just leap in a little bit, you know, then it's so difficult because there is an institutional response that may not match up with the hearts and minds of, of individual parishioners and so on. And I think that, that you know, um, best efforts do not go unnoticed by the Indigenous community, um, you know, respectful um you know, desires to engage and learn are, are always welcomed in the Indigenous community, in my experience. And, you know, I think that, that parishioners need to just see themselves as separate from the institution, see themselves as people, see Indigenous people as, indigenous people as just people, and, um, and just engage in your own definition of, of respect and identify projects that you think would be in fact impactful and you know that that the indigenous folks that you're having conversations with would see it as impactful as well um, respect is an important bottom line to those conversations i always say that um uh, one thing is to uh you know it's okay to, to ask questions i mean uh, as michelle said uh, take responsibility for for your own kind of learning that's that's one thing uh, but then um, engage with uh, the local community ask questions listen uh, to the answers and then um, you know try to collectively come up with some steps that can be taken uh, that uh, will make a difference yeah it's more I mean I, I think rather than telling you okay here's you got to do uh, you know a b c d and e I think it's more about the process of how you get to develop your own list um, and, and that involves engaging and, uh, and, and, and listening and committing to taking action. Yeah. Um, we have a, a statement as per, as, as opposed to a question that UNDRIP was adopted by the UNHRC in 2007 and only ratified by Canada in 2020, some 13 years later. As a full member of the UN, Canada has a moral and ethical obligation to implement UNDRIP. Um, I don't think anybody here would disagree. I think that that's, uh, um, you know, and I, and I think though that that 13 year um, wait, that 13 year delay is again, symptomatic of the challenges of, system, of systemic change, that it's extremely difficult um, to um, see substantive change implemented um, in systems that have based themselves on the very things that um, are trying to be changed. It's not an easy road, but it is a necessary road. And uh, with that, I would, uh, we're coming up to our last minute here. So I would really like to thank you, Len, for joining us today. It's, um, it's, it's challenging in your uh, existing role and your previous role and the, you know, the obligations that you have to um, confidentiality and, and those kinds of things. But your, your input today, I think, has been very insightful and helpful, and I really appreciate that. And I will turn it over to Mark to have some final words here. Well, it's simply to um, double and redouble those thanks, Michelle, to Justice Marchand. Um, it would have been in 2015, I guess, that Justice Murray Sinclair came to Green College. Uh, the college was his venue for, for, for a stop at UBC and in Vancouver. Um, and he uh, re reported on the work of, uh, of, the, of the commission and its report, which had by then been published. Uh, I was away that year, but there was some quite a discussion uh, with the panel that was assembled that day. Um, here we are, what, six years later, um, high time that we had some kind of an update uh, on this among other aspects of, uh, of that ongoing process. And uh, to have this uh, angle uh, illuminated today in the way that you've been able to
to illuminate it has been extremely valuable. And I'm sure saying that I speak for everybody else who's uh, been on this call. So thank you very much. Um, I should leave just long enough for Michelle uh, to confirm the details of what will, unless we persuade her to undertake a second season, uh, be, be the last in this series on, I always get them in the wrong order. Let me see if I can get it right this time. Um, it's indigenous resurgence first, isn't it? Before, yes. the, before, before the colonial fingerprints, which, which linger so visibly in the 21st century. Um, unless that second season does come about, and I don't know how we could possibly um, coax, cajole, or, or, or otherwise persuade her into that, the next one, which is just, what, a week away, uh, will be the last. Um, and Michelle will get a chance, I hope, to read perhaps from this book of hers, which as somebody said, uh, did she say it, is doing okay out there. <laughs> I mean, it's like doing super okay out there. But one of the troubles we've had with Michelle around Green College is getting her to read from it, uh, which is fair enough. I mean, we should all be reading it unprompted at this point, um, but she reads it beautifully. And if there's a chance, Michelle, if you could schedule some reading in the next one, but you do, I know, have lots else to do on that call because you're gonna be joined by some more good friends. Would you like just to say a word about that? Sure. We have a couple of guests next time, and I, I'd like to point out for, you know, the, the fans of the series that we're going to start half an hour early next week because we, we are going to have two guests. Um, Sheila Rogers, the CBC institution from the next chapter, will be joining us, and I will be joining us, and Kateria Kwenzi Dam, who is, uh, she was with us briefly on a, on a previous um, event She's a, an icon in Indigenous publishing, and she's also a tremendous poet. And so Sheila will be talking to her about her, her recent collection um, of uh, poetry that's been released. And Sheila will be talking to me about my book. <laughs> um, so hopefully that will, um, you know, satisfy your hunger for me to read from the book. <laughs> okay. So... I, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a really enjoyable event and a, and a great way to wind down the, the series this year. So again, thank you, Lynn. So appreciated. And uh, with that, we will allow the Green College students to head off to dinner because this is their dinner hour. <laughs> May I just say thank you so much for inviting me. I really uh, enjoyed the conversation and uh, I've got a bit of homework to do on Bill C-15. Uh, I see that it did receive uh, royal assent in the Senate on National Indigenous Peoples Day this year. Um, and I can tell you that I was just getting up to speed on my new job. And so somehow I missed that news. That's big news to miss. But, uh, that's very important news. And, um, and I'll be uh, following up on, on, on that, educating myself about that more. Um, but anyway, Lum Lump, uh, Cook's Chem, thank you so much for the invitation. And good luck to everyone. Take care. Take care, everybody. See you next week, hopefully.